So to me, the intro felt very open and vulnerable um, to a point that I don't think I've experienced before from you, but I'm not sure if that's an accurate statement. No, that's accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely accurate. First and foremost, I wanted to start the book by taking myself off of any kind of pedestal that anyone could have put me on, um, which is why the book starts with the, the words confession time. For most of my life, I have been a terrible person to date. Um, I just, you know, there's anyone who had ever thought, oh, he must have been a great person to date or the, the ideal partner. I just wanted to take myself off that pedestal straight away and also help people understand the journey that I went on to start to make healthier decisions in my own life, not just for myself, but for other people. Because, you know, when you're a confused person who doesn't know what you want, you, you don't just hurt yourself, you hurt other people too. I would have met my wife and I never would have made it work. I, I would have screwed the whole thing up. And that for that reason, those are those are two of the most important chapters in the book. I had to I had to shift certain things about myself, about what I was looking for, about the kind of energy that I valued in my life, um, about how I was approaching things. Audrey was awesome in ways that I wasn't being awesome, <laughs> and I quickly learned that if I didn't catch up that I was going to lose this incredible human being. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs and creators to stand out and succeed online. Now, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create beautiful websites to engage with your audience and to sell anything from products to content to time all in one place, all in your style, using one dashboard. Dream big, go big, and save big with Squarespace. And let me just start off with all the gooey, ooey stuff. You're so phenomenal. I've been following your work for such a long time. I'm in awe of everything that you have done. Congratulations on this huge accomplishment of another book. And the time that you have taken between the first book and this book is remarkable. <laughs> and when I'm reading the book, I think that's in a positive way because, you know, you could churn out five books a year if you wanted to, right? Like the amount of content that you put out, the conversations that you've had, the epiphanies you probably had along the way. But I would assume there's some intentionality in saying not yet. Mm. Um, I have a few hunches why, but I would love to hear from you. Why this book now? Well, I, I think... I, I, my publisher, Harper Collins, came to me every year since the original book yes. over 10 years ago saying, now, I've, now that I've written it, God knows when I'll do another book after this. Because <laughs> It took me four and a half years of my life to put this book together. Um, but I, I started to see, it was very clear to me that something needed to be addressed with people in their love lives. And one of those things was the dissatisfaction that so many of us feel in never finding what we really want or what we're looking for. The chronic pain of loneliness that sets in when we really want to find love and it's nowhere to be found. Um, I wanted to talk about the really hard side of looking for love that I don't think gets talked about enough. It's interesting because I'm accustomed to, and you even addressed this in the intro, you know, we're accustomed to the five ways to, you know, formula. I'm accustomed to the here's what to text if um, approach that you take with your work. Whereas this felt more nuanced and maybe some people want you to grab them by the collar and say, say this, do this. Set this as your standard, expect that, where I felt like there was a lot more onus and empowerment on the reader. Well, I, a big shift in the approach was away from tactics and towards real standards. There's a big difference between tactics and standards. You know, sta tactics are what we employ to try to get a certain result. And if we don't get the result we want, then we just try a new tactic. And standards 
remain the same no matter whether we get the result we want or not because standards are who we are. But for so many of us, the impulse is to lower our standards right now because it feels so hard out there. When, an inter when our own internal culture of anxiety and fear that it's never going to happen for us meets an external dating culture of people taking what they can get while giving the minimum possible investment, it creates a recipe for us lowering our standards. It creates a recipe for us accepting less than we de deserve or want. And it makes us lower our standards at precisely the time where we should be raising them. So I wanted to talk about some of those instincts we have to lower our standards and help people, help train people to having standards, which is for a lot of people, it feels really counterintuitive. It feels really counterintuitive if someone has not texted you for two weeks after you were having a great time talking with them every day. When that person texts you out of nowhere and says, what are you up to? It feels like I I just want to text them back. I'm just grateful they reached out. I'm just happy that they that they're still thinking of me. And it also, when people do try to have standards in those situations, one of the ways that we often get it wrong is we think that if I feign indifference or play it cool, that's my way of having standards because I'm like not giving too much. But the problem is all it does is mean that someone doesn't understand our intentions. And by not calling someone out on the behavior, we approve the behavior and we cement it. Now they think it's okay to disappear for two weeks and just come back whenever they want. And it's not going to be met with any consequences. So I, I, in this book, I help train new instincts that can actually get us much more of what we want while also allowing us to be a much more authentic, vulnerable and human version of ourselves. Are you aware that the S word is controversial? Um, are you familiar with Kevin Samuels by chance? No, and I, I, I'm so fascinated about why the S word is controversial. And that's just the interesting factor of, you know, cross-cultural dynamics, because Kevin Samuels is someone who rose to mass amounts of fame in the relationship talk space during the pandemic. And his major talking point that got people so fired up, and I think made many men feel heard, is he was attacking women's standards. And basically saying well, that yeah. women have been allowed to run unchecked with these really high standards and they're not actually up to par with what they're seeking. And so he had a very, um, <laughs> he got a lot of notoriety for humbling women. So I thought it was really fascinating because, well, I'll get your response to that and then I'll reflect on that a bit more with you. Well, that to me, I, I think I do know who you're referring to. Um, and that to me doesn't make standards a dirty word. It, what it means is we often have high standards around the wrong things. I, I speak to people all the time who say, I can never meet anyone. I struggle because I have such high standards. And then when I dig a little deeper, they'll tell me that they've been seeing this on and off person, giving them their time and their energy and intimacy for the last two years of their life. And when I ask about this person, this person treats them like crap, is inconsistent, doesn't want a relationship, has zero intentionality, picks them up and puts them down whenever they want, doesn't value them. And if you ask, why do you like this person? They'll be like, oh, there's just this, you know, I just feel so much chemistry with them. And I feel that there's something about them. I, I find them really attractive. And, you know, they start describing who they are as a person. They make a lot of money. It could be that. Sorry to interrupt, but I am here to share how Squarespace can power your next big idea. You can start a completely personalized, gorgeous website with the new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint AI. First, you choose a professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up, tailored to your business, and optimized for every device, obviously. And after you're done designing, launch and get discovered fast with integrated, optimized SEO tools so you show up more often to the people you want to be in front of. And 
you're selling products, content, a service, or your time, make checkout seamless for your customers by accepting credit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay, and in eligible countries, you can give your customers the option to buy now and pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay. And if you need help with language for your site, for your mailing list, or heck, even your invoices, Squarespace AI Kickstart has your back. Explain what your site is about, choose your tone, provide guidelines on length, and then boom. And speaking of boom, go peek around on a two-week free trial, no credit card required, at squarespace.com slash shanbooty. And when you are ready to sign up after that, get 10% off a website or domain at squarespace.com slash shanbooty. Now back to the video. So what you really mean is you have really high standards for how attractive someone is in their facial symmetry or how they dress or how charismatic they are. You have super high standards for charisma, but absolutely no standards for kindness. Absolutely no standards for how someone treats you. No standards for someone who's consistent or loyal or values you. This idea of standards is often very a la carte. And so I think what we all have to do is incumbent on all of us, frankly, if we want to be happy, to start saying, do I have high standards for the things that really matter? Because the people that I work with a lot of the time and the, what I'm seeing out there in general is people have high standards for things that don't matter and no standards for things that do matter. It sounds like a cultural commentary as well. Do you hear that? That some of that almost seems like a lot of what America values as well? Yes, <laughs> I think that's probably true. I think that in general, in the West, I think not just America, I think there is just a, um, we, we are taught very often to value the wrong things. I mean, look, I live in Los Angeles. This is the, the, the mecca of people valuing the wrong things. <laughs> it, you know, it's people who can't stop working, it, never enough never enough money, never enough success, never enough fame, never enough followers. It, it, you know, there's a kind of disease of never enough that, you know, same with contacts, never enough contacts, just keep trying to collect people all the time while having no real friendships. You know, it, there's all of that. And at a certain point in life, you have to look at what am I going to value here? Because if I just listen, if I just value what people around me are valuing, I'm going to be a lot in a lot of trouble. I, 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 I don't want to be like the never enough crowd. You know, I, I want to look at my life and go, what really makes me happy? It's not sitting on my phone all day. You know, it's, it's being with people I love. It's living in a more analog way. It's taking, having a rhythm in my life that actually works for me. And you could say that you can apply all of that to relationships too. You know, what really makes a great relationship? Well, someone who accepts me, someone who makes me calmer, someone who I feel at home with, um, someone who's consistent, someone who's loyal, someone who keeps their promises, someone who can apologize. So, you know, like all of these things make for great relationships, but we're often driven to things that don't matter either by our trauma or by ego sometimes worrying too much about the kind of person that's going to look good on our arm or the kind of person mm -hmm. that's going to impress our friends or our family or that everyone else is going to think is is great instead of the kind of person that actually makes us happy i uh speaking of which have to give a big a big congrats to you and audrey on your marriage <laughs> huge i would love to talk about how that informed your work but before that, you pulled a quote from Christopher Hitchens, uh, you have to choose your future regrets. And I thought that was so interesting because when people raise their standards, they don't consider that other side of things. Um, can you talk about how those two sentences, which may initially seem to contrast, you know, which is how to raise your standards and also how to choose your future regrets? Yeah, the, I mean, the idea of choosing your future regrets is an interesting one because you look, let's, 
let's say let's say you are at an age where you really want a family and you're also looking at your biology and saying i don't have all the time in the world for this you know if i want to have a family i have a handful of years in which to do that um and in that moment you meet someone who's 15 years younger than you who is in a completely different place in their life they barely know they want a relationship let alone have a family but you hit it off and you have a great time with them and you're excited to be with them and it feels like well it's better than nothing nothing else is going on in my love life right now you might go well if i if i wasn't with this person i would regret experiencing this person experiencing this relationship but if you really know what's important to you and what path you want to be on then you'll look at that and go what am i going to regret more letting go of this person or having this person run out another five years on my life and not want kids at the end of it or want kids and I can no longer have them because I'm ignoring my path. I'm ignoring what I really want and going for this person that feels good in the moment instead. Which one am I going to regret more? Giving up this relationship or giving up my dream of having a family? It's a really, really important question. You know, what, what, which one am I going to regret more? We have to, we're all going to regret something. There's no life without regret. I I'm not a fan of this whole like hashtag no regrets culture that we live in. I, I there's a poet, a David White, a British poet who said, you know, if you have no regrets, where have you been? <laughs> uh, it, it's, a uh, it's completely human to regret things. Um, it, even more than that, it's important because regret teaches us lessons, but we are all going to have regrets, but which are the, which are going to be the really hard regrets to bear and which are going to be the ones that we're glad we created because of the choice that we made. And, and so that, what that does to your question about standards, we have to have a standard for ourselves that says, I don't let my feelings in the moment get in the way of my path. If my path is that I want to meet someone for a serious relationship and I want to have a family and I have a certain amount of time to do that, then I'm not going to make my feelings too important just because I feel intensely for this person I just had a date with, but is not in any way aligned with my path. You know, my, my feelings, th this whole thing of like your feelings are valid. Well, they may be valid, but they may not be that important in this situation because if you follow your feelings not your path you're going to end up with a really really big regret so the standard is i don't let someone in unless they're on the same path as me because if i deviate from this path i'm going to have a regret that's going to be hard to bear i interpreted that as beautiful answer thank you for that i interpreted that too as in some ways raising your standards in one particular area more on value system and how people show up um, how they behave, what their character is, and lowering them, lowering standards, maybe on all of the, the paper things, right? So the dinner party favors, we'll say that. When you bring a partner to a dinner party, knowing that you're gonna leave with everyone being like, oh my God, what a catch, because they were really hot, they made tons <laughs> of money, they were very charismatic, like they're great dinner party favors. So I'm curious if you, if you agree with that sentence that adopting the idea that there's going to be regrets also means lowering your standards in some areas. Yeah, I, I think we we have to. I, I I think part of becoming more astute at what's going to create a happy life for us is realizing what's not as important as our 25 year old selves thought. Um, you know, I coached a or not coached. I knew a guy who um, always dated dancers like it was that was his thing and i said to him well is your wife a great dancer is she a dancer and he said oh my god she's the least coordinated person i've ever met <laughs> and i was like well does that bother you he said matthew how much of my life do you think i spend dancing he said you know a couple of times a year maybe i'm on a dance floor he said my wife is my best friend she's the greatest person 
she's an amazing mother we have the best time we laugh together that those are the things that affect my life every single day so you know i think it's it's true for all of us that there are these things that we tell ourselves we want and if we tell ourselves that story enough times we actually miss the more interesting story playing out right in front of us we we miss the person that doesn't come in the form of our normal type who actually represents something far more interesting far more complex far more beautiful but if we get stuck in these concretized versions of what we think we're supposed to have and who we think we're supposed to be with um we actually miss all of that there's a uh, to refer back to the, that poet i mentioned he wrote an essay on ambition and he said this is a really interesting phrase for what you're talking about uh shan he said uh, ambition is frozen desire and that phrase is really interesting because f what he says is ambition is what we have when we think we know what's best for us when we think we know what's going to make us the happiest we make all these plans about where we're going to end up in life and what country and how much money we're going to make and who who we're going to spend our lives with and and life is far more interest the ways you're going to feel joy and the ways you're going to find happiness and the ways that you're going to experience beauty are going to be so much more interesting than your ambitions ever made out um but i do think it's worth us starting from a position of saying what am i going to value today that maybe i didn't value enough in past relationships and by not valuing it it really really burned me because everyone most people have a relationship that they can think of where they were so anxious in that relationship they were so unhappy and while they were in it they kept telling themselves I'll never be okay without this person but the reality was that because whatever because that value was missing they were in hell when they were in the relationship so we most of us have got evidence for the fact that even if we get someone we think is super attractive if we're missing certain key elements we're miserable And if you know that then at the very least when you go out into your love life today you can make those things the fundamentals that you must have because you know that not having them makes it impossible for you to be happy with someone. What I love about the title too is that I'm sure when you tell 10 people in a room everybody has a different connotation for what love life means for them. But what grounded it for me was reading the chapter index because you really are talking about life. Like this is a book that is taking you through decades of experiences, decades of possible iterations of yourself and iterations of your love life. I was curious about the order of the chapters. Well, I I wanted to start the book by just talking about what people's experience was and validating people's experience of being single. And and how hard it is when you want to find love and and it's not working out um and to validate that there's nothing wrong with you if you're finding it really really hard out there and if you're finding it hard to be single um i then wanted to address when we are single and we're looking some of the dangers especially if we feel like love has been scarce some of the dangers and the traps that we can fall into psychologically when we're out there looking for love so how to tell love stories i talk about the fact that many of us value a love story we write love stories about a person in our lives based on what a great connection we have with them but the that's incomplete if we're not also valuing whether they're saying yes to a relationship or whether they're actually compatible with us there's a model that I talk about in that chapter that there's four levels of importance in a relationship. The first one is admiration. That's just you liking someone, but it doesn't mean very much because they may not know you exist. The second is mutual attraction. That's when you have a connection and chemistry with a person, and that feels like the most important thing in the world because you're like I never meet someone I like and then on top of it they like me back. This feels like everything. But it's not everything because if they're not saying if they're not in level 3, which is commitment, If they're not saying yes, 
then you really have nothing with this person. It's irrelevant how much of a great time you have when you're with them or how you can talk for hours or how the sex is amazing. It's kind of irrelevant because that person doesn't want what you want. So they have no value for your life in that case. And the fourth level is compatibility. And I talk about the ways that we can look at compatibility. So what a big part of the first quarter of the book is helping us reevaluate what's valuable and what's not. Because many of us have that part upside down, which is why we keep getting hurt. Then it moves into how to have hard conversations, how to actually show standards in an elegant way. Because it's one thing to say have standards, but what does that actually look like? When you want a relationship with someone, how do you have the conversation about what it is or where it's going in a way that feels strong and powerful and attractive? Um, and then as we get further into the book, it look, starts looking at why on a deeper level do we find it so hard to have these standards? You know, why, why does it sound like a nice idea to have standards, but in practice, when someone we like or love comes back to us, all of those standards go out of the window and we start accepting the same bad treatment all over again. How can we build the deepest levels of confidence that underpin our standards so that our standards are something we live by no matter what? Because if you can do that, you're going to have a, a really amazing time in life and you're going to have a much, much happier love life and much more success in attracting the kind of partner you want than if you never build that confidence. Because ultimately, if you don't build that confidence, those standards are going to fall through very quickly. So that last part, we arrive at the deepest levels of confidence. And then beyond that, the final chapter is called Happy Enough, because I believe that you don't have to be happy and whole when you're on your own. You just have to be happy enough that you can say no. Happy enough that you're not making panic decisions in your love life. You can admit that you might be happier if you found the love of your life, but you're happy enough with life as it is right now that you can hold. And that's a really, really powerful place to be. So I finish on the tools that we could apply for being happy enough. It's interesting because that's the part of the book that I was like, I wonder why this didn't go up front right? To frame it because there's the adage, right? That no one can love you if you don't love yourself. So starting your love life off with self-love would be a way that many people think about tackling this. I'm wondering if this was intentional because you're telling people that doesn't necessarily have to go in that order. Well, I, I, <laughs> self-love is a truly, truly caring about your own experience and protecting yourself which is a form of self-love, is a wonderful way to have standards. But most people find it hard to start there because they, that's not how they can, they, they don't feel connected to themselves in that way. But what I do know is that if people can really connect to the pain that they've experienced in their lives from not having standards, you don't even need confidence to make a change. You just need necessity. You just need to know I can never do that again. That was too painful. That was too much. It's like if you put if you put someone's hand in a flame, they don't need confidence to get their hand out. <laughs> they just go, this hurts too much. I'm just they just pull you, pull their hand away instinctively. What I wanted to do is get people to a place where they instinctively realize that the old ways have never worked. They've only brought me pain not having standards brings me misery. And so that's reason enough for me to have standards without me having built this deep well of confidence to draw on. But the thing I love about the, the chapter that's in the final quarter of the book that's called Core Confidence, I think it's chapter 15, it's, it's for me probably the most important chapter of, of the entire book um, because Re, I, I believe that self-love needs a rebrand. And I think that the way that self-love is being taught in a lot of places is misleading people. And I think it's people are ending up feeling very inadequate for their inability to actually achieve it. And in this book, I, I redefine what self-love is and what it looks like 
in a way that I think once people hear it, they it's like they it turns it on its head. I'm I'm happy to talk about it, but it like changes the way people think about self love once and for all. Yes, I would love for you to share I, that chapter was especially impactful for me. And I loved the themes that you brought up and the way that you made it tangible and accessible to people who may not have experienced something. I'll just put it into context. I, like many people, as you described, have that superficial surface level of confidence or had that for a long time. And again, that's a part of the culture that we're, you know, that we're in, you know, you do great things, then you get great accolades and love is one of those things. Praise is one of those things. So you learn to love yourself on that system. So if you would have asked me, you know, five years ago, what do you love about yourself? Would have been like, really smart. I'm really outgoing. I'm really fit. I'm really this, all of these things. And during my second pregnancy, I was none of those things. On top of that, I felt alien in my body. On top of that, I felt too exhausted to tackle the work that I was doing. And on top of that, I was already a mom of a small kid. So I felt like I was failing her, you know, not being present for my partner. And when I tried to rely on self-love for a semblance of confidence or for a purpose or worthiness in this world, when I went through my checklist of all the things I loved about myself, I didn't measure up against any of those. So I'm like at a time where I need love the most, it's not accessible to me because I don't qualify for my own standards within them. So I love the idea of core confidence of that because you're separating self-love from self-praise. You're separating self-love from worthiness. Um, but I would love for you to elaborate more on that. Yeah, well, you just phrased it very, very well. I, I, um, I think that the problem we have with self-love is it's something we're trying to feel. And most of us have a hard time accessing that feeling. Um, and we try to access it by telling ourselves, just like you said, all of the things that are awesome about ourselves, all of the things that are great about me. And if I can do that enough, maybe I'll feel love for myself the same way I feel love for someone else. The way I fall in love with a person, maybe I can fall in love with myself. But it doesn't really work. Um, if familiarity breeds contempt in relationships, who would we have more contempt for than the person we've spent every waking moment with our entire lives? We have gone to bed with ourselves and woken up with ourselves every day since the day we were born. We are so familiar with ourselves that we've long since stopped being impressed by anything that's impressive about us. And we have focused on all of the deficiencies, all of the insecurities, all of the flaws, all of the things we don't like about ourselves. So contempt tends to be a pretty strong emotion when it comes to ourselves for a lot of people. So what do we do? Well, I believe we have to adopt a different model for loving ourselves. And one of the great models to look at is the parent-child relationship. When you ask a parent, why do you love your child? They don't reel off a bunch of characteristics about their child. <laughs> they, well, they look at you like you're a crazy person. They're like, what do you mean? Because they're mine, because they're my child. That holds the key to, to what self-love really looks like, which is that that same philosophy of a parent saying, I love them because they're mine, is the model by which we can love ourselves. Because you are the human that is yours. Of 8 yes. billion people on this earth, you don't have to think that you're special in comparison to everyone else. You only need to know that you're yours. You don't get to exchange you for another human. So to that extent, comparison with other people is irrelevant. You just need to know that it is your job <laughs> to take care of this human. This person, there's only one human apart until the time you, people have children, there's only one human that is truly in your custody and that's you. And so when someone asks you, why do you love yourself? Imagine saying to that person, what are you talking about? Because I'm mine, I'm my human. And if you wake up in the morning and you say, this human, where, who's, it, it's my job to give them the best life I can, what would I do today if I was trying to give this human the best life I could? What would I do today if I was protecting this human, standing up for this human, 
encouraging this human, nurturing this human. What would I do today? What decisions would I make? How would I behave? How would I go out into the world? And that, and the answers are very different. I can guarantee for most people, the answers are very different than what you did yesterday. Because if you, if, if you went to someone's house who's been treating you like crap for the last two years of your life, and you still went over there and you still slept with them and you still gave them the time of day, even though they want completely different things than you and they just use you all the time, you're not protecting your human. In fact, you keep putting your human in the vicinity of someone who doesn't care about them. That's not something you do. If that was your child, you wouldn't do that. So with yourself, you have to say, am I doing right by my human right now? Am I giving them the best shot I can at a happy life? And that changes everything because it takes self-love away from being a feeling and it takes it into being an approach. Self-love mm -hmm. isn't something you have to feel right now. Most people don't like themselves, let alone love themselves. <laughs> but you don't have to like yourself in order to love yourself when loving yourself is an approach. When loving yourself is a verb, when you treat it like it's your job, because it is, all of a sudden you've realized liking yourself can come later. Loving yourself comes first. It's uh, to parallel that to romantic relationships, it feels like an arranged marriage um, <laughs> approach to love. <laughs> and I wonder if you think that there's crossover there in terms of romantic love being an approach first and a feeling second. Oh, that's interesting. I'd never even considered that. Um, I, you know, I suppose there is a parallel between the two. I, I, the arranged marriages seem inherently problematic <laughs> to me, um, you know, from the point of view of the ways that they can lead people into really difficult or even abusive relationships. But if you apply the best parts of that to loving yourself, which are that I am taking the approach of loving myself, um, that then I, I see the parallel. It's an interesting one. I'd never considered it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's also, you know, in, in that, you know, brain thought because you don't pick yourself, but you, you know, you love yourself. And then for some people, there's so many things they don't have, they don't get to choose on their own. But yeah. I mean, this is a place I agree that is, beautifully expressed and done when you feel like this is a decision that you made for yourself, an informed decision. And by the um, way, there's something really, there's something so liberating about that idea that you don't choose yourself. Like you didn't go to the buffet of human beings and choose a human. You just got a human. <laughs> and yeah. there's something so liberating about that because when you realize you just got a human and you didn't have a choice in the matter, this is the human you got. Who cares that you don't like your nose? Like, who cares that you, you wish your body shape was a bit different genetically or that you don't, you're not as smart as this person over here or you're not as, like, it's all irrelevant when you realize that you didn't have a choice in the first place. It, it, there's something yes. really liberating <laughs> about that. You go, oh, I got a human. My job is just to do the best I can with this human that I got. That's it. Yeah, they talk about this with the, in the psychological sense. You know when you choose a car and then for the next two months, all you do is look at other cars in the road and then ask yourself why you didn't pick that one? <laughs> you don't have to do that with yourself. You never had a choice. This you was never the car had the a choice in the first place. Get in and drive it, baby. Do what you can do. <laughs> well, on that note, you've, got, you've made a really big choice recently. Um, and I want to say a huge congratulations on that. There's a million Thanks. questions people could probably ask you in this vein. I actually want to reflect on this because... I acknowledge that I am a consumer of your content, but I may not consume every single piece of it. So to me, the intro felt very open and vulnerable um, to a point that I don't think I've experienced before from you, but I'm not sure if that's an accurate statement. No, that's accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely accurate. It's, uh, I, 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 I think I, 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 I didn't want to write this book unless I was prepared to just really like write in an in a kind of I suppose write from a point of view of what's going to help people the most not what's going to make me look the best I just wanted to say what's helpful to people and I think first and foremost I wanted to start the book by taking myself off of any kind of pedestal that anyone could have put me on um, 
which is why the book starts with the, the words confession time for most of my life. I have been a terrible person to date. Um, I just, you know, there's anyone who had ever thought, oh, he must have been a great person to date or the, the ideal partner. I just wanted to take myself off that pedestal straight away and also help people understand the journey that I went on to start to make healthier decisions in my own life, not just for myself, but for other people. Because, you know, when you're a confused person who doesn't know what you want, you, you don't just hurt yourself, you hurt other people too. Um, and, uh, and I had to start very consciously making better decisions, making healthier decisions for myself. It's not a coincidence that because I didn't start writing this book as, as a person who got married. I got married last year. When I started writing this book four and a half years ago, I was, I was going through all sorts of different things. I was going through heartbreak. I was then a single person who was out there looking again and was uh, it, wondering whether I would find what I was looking for. I wrote chapters of this from some of the darkest periods of my life. I wrote chapters of this when I was first dating Audrey, who is now my wife, I finished the last edit on, on our honeymoon, <laughs> you know, like this, this literally this book has, has followed me through so many different moments in my own love life. And I think that's why people will, will when they read it, they'll see themselves because they're not going to see someone who's just happily married and is talking about how they got there. I, I'm not interested in that book nor do I think that my example should be the example to follow. I, I really, that's not what this book is. But I think what they will see is someone who's relating to those different phases that they find themselves in because, you know, I was, I was in those myself. I was in those dark places. What an interesting case study that is to probably see the iterations of the book based on where you were at. Were there things that you went back and corrected because <laughs> of your informed experience? Or did you want to leave it authentic and say, at this place, I said this, I felt this. I want the people who are there to connect with that. The, the first few chapters when I first, this was years ago, when I first handed a few chapters to my publisher, um, many, many iterations ago, I thought that she was going to like rub her hands together and say, this is it. Oh my God. Like, you know, 10 years later, this is gold. And she read those first couple of chapters and she said, this is all wrong. You can't do this. this is she, she like sent an email back. And I think she started the email by saying, Shan, imagine how hurtful this was. She sent an email back and I think the first thing she said was, I really wanted to like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it I laugh from a space of I've gotten that email before. <laughs> it crushed me. It crushed me. And I, yeah. like, I ended up saying to her, what's wrong? Like, wh you know, what was wrong with this? She was like, you seem so mad. She was like, you, it's t the tone of it. There's just, you're so mad and pissy and I was like I had no idea that's how I was coming across but it's because I was always writing from these very authentic places so the 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 final version of this book is a lot more um playful <laughs> and a lot more you know there's there's a softer energy coming through but yeah there were definitely versions of it tonally especially that I that I changed along the way yeah well last question i have for you is reflecting on that you know when you were in that space and you talk very candidly about this in the intro of the book of coming off of heartbreak um when you were in your darkest place of your love life what chapters if you were to pick five would you hand to young matthew and say let's start here Oof. well there's a there's a chapter that's very on the nose that's uh, surviving a heartbreak um that i would give to myself because that has very very practical tools on how to move through heartbreak in a really healthy way but also with some unique ideas um i would have given myself happy enough the final chapter uh, because that though the tools in that chapter i have about seven tools in that chapter that 
are the tools that I've used to get through the hardest times in my entire life. There's two chapters that live side by side. One is called Never Satisfied and the other one is called How to Rewire Your Brain. They're two of my favorite chapters in the whole book. Without those, I would not, I would have met my wife and I never would have made it work. I, I would have screwed the whole thing up. And that, for that reason, those are, those are two of the most important chapters in the book. I had to, I had to shift certain things about myself, about what I was looking for, about the kind of energy that I valued in my life, um, about how I was approaching things that became more and more apparent to me as I was, as I was dating my wife, um, certain you know i don't want to paint a i'm, I'm try I, I try to be careful because sometimes i think i paint an overly kind of um a, almost a masochistic picture of myself I, I sometimes don't give myself enough credit but there were in our when we were dating audrey was awesome in ways that i wasn't being awesome <laughs> and i quickly learned that if I didn't catch up that I was going to lose this incredible human being um, so that for me those two chapters were huge and for anyone who I would say for anyone who feels like they keep crashing into the same wall in their love life for anyone who feels like they keep ending up with the same kinds of people who are wrong for them or keeps ending up in the same kinds of situations those two chapters alone, I say this without hyperbole, will, will change your life. Um, they, they changed mine. So, yeah. Beautiful. I think that that's a great encouragement for everyone to go and check out the book and read it. What I love about the title, too, is the love life. How I interpret that is you're going to be in this shit for a long time. And I think that's also part of the reflection, too, of you sharing these parts of yourself along the way. And that isn't to say like this person didn't have a handle on their love life or this person was failing at their love life, but it's like this was a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And so embracing all those various steps and acknowledging that it's a long life and there's going to be a lot of learning and a lot of loving to do and which is also good news because that means more books from you. So uh, it's, that's, I guess very, that's very well said. I, I, I love that you said that and finished with that because um, it is... I, I believe there are three relationships that ultimately determine the quality of our life. Our relationship with other people, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with life itself. And those are all relationships you're going to be in until the day you die. Um, and and life, our relationship with life is like a marriage, you know. you. And sometimes you love life and it feels like life doesn't love you back. It feels like life keeps handing you these tragedies and these chaos and destruction and bad situations after bad situations after bad situations and it's really easy in those times to fall out of love with life um but it's uh i, I hope this book will help people not just you know find their person and find the love they're looking for sooner but i i wrote this to give people the tools to start loving life again today which uh certainly makes the journey to finding love a lot easier. It means we're not deferring our living until the point where we suddenly meet our person. Thanks for your time, Matthew. Thanks for having me. And uh, for anyone, by the way, who does want to get a copy of the book, um, it's at lovelifebook.com. You can grab a copy there. And right now we have a, a really cool thing where if you register your purchase on that site, we actually have a free event that I'm doing on uh, what is it, May the 4th, called Find Your Person, where we're going to take the concepts from the book and bring them to life in your year so that you can actually start moving forward and making real progress in your love life this year using the concepts from the book. So anyone who gets a copy of the book gets a free ticket to that virtual event. Uh, and you can both get the book and your free ticket on lovelifebook.com.